So we're here today to talk about uh, active, uh, active versus passive. Um, and I, I wouldn't have thought 10 years ago that I would have been standing up here today talking about active, active versus passive, but it is fascinating, isn't it, to see uh, how markets evolve uh, over the longer term. And uh, we've seen a lot of change, haven't we, over the last, uh, last few years, particularly post-GFC, uh, and we'll be talking an awful lot about that today. Um, but by way of the, uh, the order of service, we'll look back at a bit of history in terms of uh, the growth of passive, what that all means um, for all of us here in the room, active or passive, uh, implications for active managers such as ourselves and how we're responding. And also we'll touch on some unintended consequences as well. That's almost another um, topic in itself, but we'll just touch on, uh, we'll touch on that uh, today. So in terms of the actual uh, growth in, uh, in, in passive, well, it's actually been around for a long time. Uh, Jack Bogle launched the, uh, the first index mutual fund in uh, 1985. But what we have here on this bar chart um, is the, an illustration of the, the growth in passive uh, since the turn of the century, 2000. So what this depicts, uh, just by way of summary, is the growth in global ETFs since 2000. The dark blue bar is equities. Uh, the light blue bar is fixed interest, and then the little red bit there is uh, commodities and other. Um, so what we can see here over the 18 years since the turn of the century uh, is really two distinct periods. The first nine years, negligible growth, roughly 79 billion um, through to 1.1 trillion. So I've an increase of around about 1 trillion um, in the first nine months, uh, the first nine years of this, uh, of this century. Then the next nine years, post-GFC, and we'll be talking an awful lot today about the post-GFC period, you can see the growth picked up there from $1.1 trillion to $4 trillion, an increase of around about $3 trillion. And as we can see there by the dark blue line, very much dominated by, uh, by equities. And in fact, the growth has been most pronounced in the, uh, in the US. Um, now, what this does here is pick up the, uh, the trend since 2009 post-GFC uh, in US equities, um, yellows uh, active, um, and blues, uh, blues passive. So you can see there on the left-hand side there the active passive fleet in, U in US equity funds um, at 2009, around about 82.18 in terms of the mix. And as we move on to the, to the right-hand side there, the mix is roughly two-thirds, one-third, 63% uh, active, 37% uh, um, passive. So here in Australia, uh, whilst the growth's been primarily US-driven, we have seen some growth in, uh, in, in, in passive, but not nearly to the same extent uh, as we'll see in a few minutes that we've seen it in the US. But I think what's also interesting is that notwithstanding the massive passive push, uh, active investing in US equities is still chosen by two thirds of all investors. So let's move, move now on to what have been the key drivers and benefits driving the growth in passive. And we've outlined five there um, of where passive provides a number of benefits. Low cost, fees matter in a low return environment, no benchmark risk. What's interesting about that one is that it does remove the risk of picking the wrong fund manager or the wrong stock. But on the other hand, however, what comes with that is the good, the bad and the ugly. We'll talk a bit more about that in a few minutes' time. Points three and four, wide range of choice, easy access to a large range of asset classes. Listed structures, a major trend here which we're noticing, ETF structures providing convenience and transparency. So again, points three and four, very, very positive outcomes, I think, for all of us alike. And what we're now seeing in, in the Australian market is the emergence of active ETFs, ETMFs, a bit of a mouthful, um, and I think we'll see more of that in Australia as well. The last point there, number five, um, I think that less active alpha from active managers. I mean, active managers no doubt have struggled in a post-GFC environment, and I think we would consider that we're part of that as well. It, it, so I think it's been arguably the, the biggest driver of the move to passive and has made the argument in, in itself uh, for passive investment more compelling. So let's now explore this trend more deeply to understand just why this has occurred. Much of it centres around volatility. The more volatility, the greater the opportunity set for active investors, and the less volatility, the less the opportunity set for, uh, for active investors. Volatility can be measured in two ways. The first one is dispersion. Now, dispersion measures how much stock returns differ from each other across the market. And this is quite fascinating to look at this. This goes way back, and this is the US where most of the data um, is gathered, uh, back to 1972. So over 40 years of data here. And in very simplistic terms, the higher that line is, the higher the dispersion is, 
the greater the opportunity set for active managers. And the lower the line, the lower dispersion, um, the harder it is to, to, to add value. Um, and so the difference in returns between individual stocks is low when dispersion is low. And what we can see there is it's simplistically with, with the dispersion quite low there for quite a period of time now, that the opportunity set for active investors has been very low for a number of reasons, uh, for, well, it, for a number of years. And that leads us to the second measure of, of volatility, and that's correlation. So correlation measures the extent to which stocks move in the same direction at the same time. And again, this goes way back to 1972 in the United States. High correlation, stocks tend to go up and down together, hard to add value when everything moves the same way. So you can see that if you look on the right hand side, last nine years post the GFC, much higher share price correlations, around about 35% on average. Whereas if you move back the previous 35 years, um, moving back to the left hand scale way back to 1972, you can see the correlation on average around about 15%, but much of the time sub 10%. In a more rational market, there are typically many factors which drive markets and share prices. And it's generally a healthy mix of both macro and stock specific. But post GFC, we have all seen that it has been two dominant global macro factors, namely QE, quantitative easing, and prolonged low interest rates which have driven markets. So in summary, we can see that the two key drivers of market volatility, dispersion and correlation, have both been massively in favour of passive and have conspired against active over that period of time. Let's now look at the influence of QE on this. And this is one of the more, more fascinating um, charts which we came upon as we put this presentation to the, together a couple of months ago. What we have here once again is two distinct periods, uh, 2000, early 2000 through to 2009 and then 2009 through to this current period. The dark blue line, Again, US data, the dark blue line indicates the extent of outperformance. So across uh, above zero, um, the horizontal line there, outperformance, and then dropping off uh, over, the, over the subsequent period. The light blue line there on the left-hand side is the size of the US uh, Fed balance sheet. So you can see there in the first half, or pre-GFC, pre um, active investing um, was working very well. Uh, the Fed balance sheet remaining remarkably consistent at around about US $1 trillion there. But the, the more fascinating aspect of this overhead is to look again at that post-GFC period. Now on the right hand side what we've done is that we've inverted um, the size of the Euro and ba US balance sheet or Fed balance sheet to give you a sense of the correlation. You can see there uh, as that light blue line uh, as a Fed balance sheet as we all know grew, grew massively from circa $1 trillion to now around about $4.5 trillion it's been quite remarkable to see the underperformance of active managers. So it's actually quite extraordinary to see this relationship between QE and the extent to which active managers have underperformed over that period. Thus the Fed put option and very low interest rates has driven up all share prices more or less similarly. I have effectively made it easier for investors to make money as they've largely eliminated stock specific risk. Active investing has struggled to add value in the face of markets being purely driven by global macro factors, which have only headed one way since the GFC. And this is what has underpinned the significant push, particularly in the US, towards passive. So what does this mean for, for all of us, investors, advisors? Um, and I, I, well, I think the first point to make here is that there's been a lot of good that's come out of this period. Investors have enjoyed very good returns, as we know, across most asset classes, whilst at the same time, a lot more choice has opened up. Um, what this uh, depicts here is the Australian landscape and a lot has happened in a very, very short period of time. On the left hand side there, that depicts the growth in exchange traded products um, uh, since 2012. Number of products has grown from circa 70 to now over 220. The size of that, that pool or the market cap of that pool has grown from about $7 billion to $37 billion. Big numbers in themselves, but in the context of a, a stock market in Australia, it's market cap of about $1.8 trillion, again percentage wise not nearly as, as much as we've seen in the US. Then on the pie chart on the right hand side, it's quite fascinating just to look at the diversity. If we go back say 10 years ago, that diversity simply wasn't available in terms of Australian traded products. 
the, the, the light blue line there, low cost index tracking global equity funds, have been by far the biggest growers, I'm sure we all know. But there are also a range of other choices there, fixed income global, fixed income Australia, property global, um, around the right hand side there, commodities, um, equity Australia as well. But products are becoming more complex, smart beta, factor based, rules based, yield, EPS growth. So there is much to like here, however, like any new trend where circumstances are complete in its favour, it must be buyer beware. This is a, a really interesting quote from Howard Marks, who I'd regard as one of the great global investors in a range of asset classes. He founded Oak Tree Capital many, many years ago. What should we think about the willingness of investors to turn over their capital to a process in which neither individual holdings nor portfolio construction is a subject of thoughtful analysis and decision making and in which buying takes place regardless of price? This highlights my greatest concern with passive investing. You get the good, the bad and the ugly and why would I aspire to that? Adding value where you need it most, active managers tend to outperform in down markets. I think this is, a, this is a critical point. We've outlined there some of the periods where active managers on average have outperformed, going way back to the recession of the early 90s, which a number of us in this room will remember. Uh, the tech wreck in the early 2000s, uh, the GFC in 2008 and 2009. And it sort of talks to this issue of, of sequencing risk, whereas we know sequencing risk is the risk of having to sell assets at the very wrong time um, when you're invested in markets. So if someone, if, if, for example, who's in the post-retirement super phase of their life and, and you have to sell capital when the markets are down, that's a very bad outcome. So I think what this is telling us is that there is a very real risk that the greater the allocation to passive as an overall observation, the greater the sequencing risk, risk could be. So, Active, uh, active versus passive. Well, there's no doubt, and that came out in the earlier polling there, um, that there's room for both. And the mix is somewhat, in, is somewhat dependent on what your, what your strategy is. Um, there's a lot of useful guidance which we put together in our, our brochure, which is sitting on your table in front of you. Um, and uh, it's a good reading for a, a, another day. But on, on the back page of that brochure um, is an illustration of the overhead which we've got up here. At, at, at the moment. It's actually a kaleidoscope of, of various asset classes which we think might be more appropriate in passive versus, versus active. So passive, for example, a cash ETF, low cost accessing wholesale rates for term deposits and short term money market securities. On the other hand, active, um, small mid cap shares, which is something we do at perennial value. Under research stocks, we find they're poorly covered. A good active manager can earn real value. On the top right hand side there you can see equity, equity, equity for income, investing in shares for income. We really think that's a, uh, that there's a place there for that in, in active as well. And our own humble little way of perennial value, we launched a, an ETMF recently, a shares for income capability. The share market code for what it's worth is EIGA, early days, but we're excited about that. So in thinking about how an all important balance portfolio should look, um, and this is, this is uh, interesting to, to look at here. The, uh, this, the yellow line um, is a passive indexed balance fund. The blue line uh, is a well-constructed portfolio of active managers constructed by Lonsec in this case, which commenced in 2003. The key point here is that this outperformance has been achieved during a period of major headwinds for active, as we've been discussing. Thus, I think one of the positive outcomes for Active is that this recent difficult period for Active is leading to better and more sophisticated Active capabilities, which can only be a good thing for investors in the longer term. And if one digs a bit deeper into the Lonsec Balance Fund, we won't go into this in detail, but in summary what it does show is that you can generate alpha with less volatility, leading to better risk-adjusted returns. So what are the implications for active managers such as ourselves and, and, and how we as a group, a group responding? Um, the, the responses have been, have been quite widespread. Um, we've had to change. We've had to meet the changing, need, changing needs of investors and I think that's been a good thing. Uh, product innovation, uh, developing new products which are not easily replicable by passive strategies. Uh, less benchmark driven, increased focus on absolute returns. Listed structures, moving to listed ETMF structures. Um, we've seen Platinum do that, we've seen Magellan do that in our own humble little way, as I mentioned a minute ago, we're doing it as well at perennial value. 
um, lowering costs, fee structures are becoming more competitive. I think one of the more interesting ones from my point of view um, is the industry consolidation, which we're seeing globally, and I think we'll see more here in Australia as well. Globally, Henderson's coming together with Janus to become Janus Henderson. Um, in the UK, Aberdeen and Standard Life, I think we'll see more uh, going forward. So broadly, I see this move to passive as a combination of structural and cyclical factors at play. The above, which we've just gone through, is structural and very good news for end investors. Let's now look at the, uh, the cyclical bit. Um, what we have here um, is, is, again, a, a lot of data going back to the, uh, the early 1990s. And it's quite interesting. I'm a great believer in sort of long-term trends that come and go over multi-year periods. And that's what we can see here in this, in this overhead here. Um, where, the, where the bar charts are above the, the horizontal um, line there, that's a good time for active. And, and, and the opposite, when it's below, a good time for, for passive. And if you look on the right-hand side there, as we know and as we've been discussing, there's been quite a protracted period there where, where passives um, out, outperformed. And, and, and it's quite interesting when you, when you look at those long-term trends at any point in time when a trend's either up here or down there, you do ask yourself, are we at a turning point back in, in this case, back in uh, favour of global? One of the indicators that could help us in, in trying to answer this question is to look at global economic growth. Um, what this is here is what's called a global wave. It comes from Bank America, Merrill Lynch, um, and it's been done by one of the um, um, preeminent global economic strategists sitting inside the organisation. And they've got data going back of many, many years, right back into the, the mid 80s, picks up a range of key economic indicators and it all comes together in this, uh, this global wave. What's interesting about this is that it's only been quite recently, i.e. in the last year or so, as we all know, that the world's just started to move back into synchronised economic growth. And so we're arguably in the early stages of that economic, uh, synchronised economic growth. That could well mean that we see a reversal of the global macro settings. So what happens over that period, of this forthcoming period, perhaps, is that QE becomes QT, quantitative easing to quantitative tightening, and interest rates have already begun to rise and, and most likely will rise further from here. So these are the very opposite macro settings that have driven markets and, to a large extent, the push for passive since the GFC. And in thinking about active versus passive, that will inevitably lead to rising volatility, reduced correlation and higher dispersion across both asset classes and stocks. That's all good news for active investors. And in many years to come, perhaps we'll look back on this period now, 2018, as a turning point in that regard. One final point um, in relation to unintended uh, consequences. Very interesting quote here, um, which we'll get to in a minute. But before we have a look at that, the, the, the influence of passive and we see this on, a, on a almost daily basis in, in the stock markets. On the left-hand side here, again, US data, the amount of the stock market, the S&P 500 owned by Vanguard, the change in that from 2010 to now. Now, this is just Vanguard, excludes other major players such as State Street and, and BlackRock. So on the left-hand um, bar chart there, um, in 2010, Vanguard owned about 3.3% of the overall US stock market. Now it's just under 7%. The more interesting one is the, the bar chart on the right-hand side, and that's the percentage of the stocks where Vanguard owns more than 5% of the float. In 2010, 23% of the stocks. Now it's an incredible 98% of stocks. So what, what does this all mean? In short, it can result in very distorted share prices. In the active world, a company's share price is determined by fundamental considerations, such as the quality of the company and valuation. In the passive world, the share price is solely driven by inflows or outflows from passive funds, not by investment fundamentals. And it does raise another interesting point. Yes, ETFs do provide lots of benefits, including liquidity, but how does that play out for investors if there is a big run on a large popular passive ETF containing lots of shares which have been bid up solely on the back of inflows? Which brings us to an interesting quote um, by, by Larry Fink, the CEO of, of BlackRock. Um, if you're an active manager and you don't like the company, you, you can sell the company. I can't sell. 
One final and very important point related to corp corporate governance, again, within the issues of unintended consequences. As an active investor, we take that very seriously, uh, as many of you will know. We need to hold the bad guys to account and we see ourselves as guardians of your client's hard-earned savings. This is much less of an issue in the passive world. Um, so moving now to, uh, to, to wind up, um, four key points in closing. First of all, active and passive unequivocally, unequivocally both have a role to play. Uh, they both have positive attributes and there's no doubt that combining the two makes sense. Secondly, post the GFC, the global macro settings have undoubtedly been a key driver in the growth of passive. Number three, this has driven a structural change whereby investors have a much greater choice of product. And I think that's a very positive outcome for all of us. Fourthly, from a cyclical perspective, with QE reversing to become QT, and lower interest rates reversing to moving higher, both driven by arguably the early stages of synchronised global growth, I think the trend most likely reverses back in favour of equities active going forward. Thanks very much for your attention and uh, I'll hand you back to Dante.